Hello and welcome to Dream Nation. I'm your host, Yulia, and this podcast is brought to you by Fund Dreamer, a global crowdfunding platform for social impact, promoting women and diversity-led projects. Our vision is to unite the whole entire world behind your dream. Maybe you might not want to start your dream right away. Maybe you want to start it later. In the meantime, you might want to support somebody else's dream. We have the Hedy Lamar project still going on. We're creating a memorial for the incredible Hedy Lamar in Austria with Susan Sarandon's production company, Reframe Pictures. Tell your friends and help promote women and diversity. We need to create our own economy. We have to create our own VCs, our own investors to uplift each other and help each other's dreams come true. Check it out. Tell your friends and enjoy the podcast. I'm here with Henrik Werderlin, and he enjoys turning nothing into something with good people. He's co-founder of BarkBox and angel advisor and other startups via venture development firm Prehype, where he's managing partner. Prior to these adventures, Henrik was the entrepreneur in residence with Index Ventures. Before Index, he was running product development for MTV International, where he spearheaded the development of MTV's award-winning innovative digital products such as TV formats, broadband channels, and mobile games. He's Danish and lives in the U.S., Fast Company recently named him amongst the top 100 most creative people in business. I start out my podcast with the same question to everyone. And my question is, what was your dream as a kid? I think it went through a few iterations. Um, I don't know why, but when I was super uh, young, I had this idea I wanted to go into kind of genetics and gene manipulation and stuff like that. But for some reason that kind of quickly changed and so for the longer time when I was a kid I wanted to be a journalist and so I had this dream of being a CNN correspondent and, and so on. The first part of my career I kind of pursued that and started school magazines and wrote the school play and started radio channels and CD-ROMs and <clears throat> ended up being uh, first a radio producer at the BBC and then uh, I went into uh, become a producer at MTV then I got drafted into the digital side. So what was the first piece of tech that you built, even as a kid? Well, I was always really intrigued. It's, it's sort of a funny story. So I grew up with my mom, and uh, she's an historian and an incredible woman in many ways, and is very entrepreneurial in kind of her, her spirit, like everything is always possible. And at the time, when I was pretty young, probably seven or eight, she, um, she used to work for the Danish National um, Library and had this very incredible boss uh, which uh, told her that basically whatever you do make sure your son gets into computers. And so she spent all her money on a Commodore PC-1 which kind of like the first computer and uh, and I it was basically I had to play with because she spent all her money on it and so well, everybody else got to go and play soccer ball I kind of had to get stuck playing with the computers. And so I, as many other kids, kind of tore all of the stuff apart and try to build it back together. And so the first kind of tech tech I think I built was a um, was a CD-ROM. And so this is back in the in the mid '90s, and um, we came up with this idea of basically making a broadband TV channel, uh, like an interactive TV channel. But of course, at that time, the internet wasn't really developed and so we would burn it down to a CD and then we would sell it um, basically in, in magazine stores and so you would pay 10 bucks to get basically get all these stories and so I did that with a friend of mine and, and that was probably my first kind of real tech product. That's awesome. I read something about your mom that you um, you helped her publish a book too. I did a little bit of uh, background <laughs> reading on you Henrik, I know this. <laughs> so uh, my mom being Part wonderful, part crazy, um, is always kind of thinking about new kind of projects to throw herself at. And since she's written so many books, uh, we were talking a little bit about what could be a fun book uh, maybe to write together. And so we came um, up with this idea of basically writing uh, Internet for Mummies. And, and it was, a, I guess it's really a book about how you stalk your children. Um, but it became more of a book of like if you are if you're a little bit up in your age and you think technology is scary, what are some of the things you can use it for? So she's very active on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and what have you and has now been, she wrote this book and we were lucky enough to it becoming a, a bestseller in Denmark and so she's been, been kind of touring around and basically educating um, people a little bit older about how to use technology. I love it. She's a digital prophet. She's definitely a digital prophet. She basically had no fear and so I get. I remember once I came home. She lives in a very little village, kind of a few hours from Copenhagen, Denmark, 
and I came there one and I came down there one day and she was like, Oh yeah, the C D ROM on my computer has broken, but I found an old one amongst your computer equipment, so I just replaced it. And so she literally took the computer apart. And the other time she kind of like had this idea she wanted to set up a Wi Fi network across the whole village because like that would be really smart and everybody could piggyback on her network and so she had all these antennas and things like that. And so I think one thing that makes her pretty incredible when it comes to technology is she's completely fearless with computers and she, she basically throws herself at anything. That's incredible. That's really amazing. I say that a lot because I think things are still incredible. Um, uh, to go back to Index Ventures, so after MTV, you landed at Index Ventures as an entrepreneur in residence. What led you to Index Ventures? Uh, were you launching a startup at the time? So I had uh, done a startup after MTV in the video space in Index Ventures since Sequoia uh, made uh, our seed investment. And so when we exit that business, I kind of, as many entrepreneurs, didn't really know what to do next. I think as an entrepreneur, you kind of have these in-between gigs kind of periods where you're not kind of ready to go to a corporate. You don't necessarily want to go back in the coffee shop and just start from scratch again because you need to lift your wings a little bit. And then being an investor was not necessarily something I wanted to do. And so Index um, was kind enough to offer me kind of this, e this EAR job, which it's kind of a weird role because you're basically just trying to figure out what to do next. And so you spend some time, at least at Index, you spend some time trying to come up with a new thing. You help portfolio companies a little bit and you get introduced to basically how investing works. And so it was, it's an incredible job and, and, uh, and the guys at Index was very kind to basically host me for a year's time while I kind of came up with what my next thing would be. And that next thing was? Well, the next thing for me was basically to move to New York. I, I always had like a lot of fear with the city. Um, I think it's, I still get goosebumps when I see Manhattan materialize when I'm driving from the airport. And so I always had this kind of g giggly feeling uh, in New York. And so I was very passionate about moving over here. And so uh, I basically um, had two things happening at the same time. Um, I had this idea about pre-hype, which was basically that entrepreneurs have this period of time where they don't know necessarily what to do and they're looking to hang with like-minded people they're looking to basically finance their lifestyle a little bit by doing a few ad hoc projects um, but they really don't have their next idea yet and so I wanted to create a community or space where entrepreneurs in between gigs could kind of hang out and so I moved over here uh, to set that up um, and had uh, these two things happen one where where I, it dawned on me that the core of a good company is to kind of come up with a problem, find a very well-defined problem, and then wrap technology or, or business model around that. Um, and often an entrepreneur don't want to be in the space that they used to be, and so I didn't want to do anything new in the video space, which I've been in for a long time. Um, and then I, I kept meeting all these people from big companies who had these amazing um, problems to solve, but they also had patents and licenses and distribution power and all these incredible things. But they just didn't have access to the entrepreneurial talent and they didn't have the, um, they didn't really have the methodology for kind of doing something out of nothing. Um, so that was kind of the focus. Meanwhile, I was lucky enough to meet a small team here in New York um, called Hot Potato, um, led by a guy called Justin, and they were kind of looking for somebody to help them out with advice and, and product kind of counseling and so I landed kind of like a half uh, half job there um, and so I was kind of doing those two things at the same time and then uh, we were fortunate enough that uh, Hot Potato got sold to um, to Facebook which gave me a little bit of money to basically finance the build out of, of Prehype and where we now do two things mainly two things we, we basically build startups from scratch and we do that with the corporate partners that we have that offer us insights and and assets and then we do it with our own money uh, where we build uh, startups uh, when we see problems in the world that we think that we can solve. It's pretty awesome. Prehype <laughs> is really fun. What advice do you have for startups who are raising money for the first time? Hmm. I think for a founder or founder team that's looking to raise capital, my first question I think specifically these days would be do you want to raise capital at all? There's a lot of companies out there that I think can be incredible businesses, but they are probably they probably shouldn't raise capital. And the issue with raising capital is it's 
it's often nice when you get going because you can hire more people and you can finance your lifestyle and stuff like that. Um, but you kind of get on a treadmill and there's no way out of that. Like the, your investors would want their money back at one point. They are often much more focused on um, selling the company than necessarily running a profitable company where you get dividends and stuff like that. And increasingly, I think a lot of entrepreneurs are looking at non-tech solutions. And so you, I think you can run pretty successful businesses today without necessarily getting traditional capital. I think after, um, after that, I would look a little bit if I feel I have done enough signal tested in the market to figure out if this business is a good or bad idea. Oh, a good or bad idea. Not necessarily because um, they should be overly worried of losing the venture capital's money, which obviously they should, but they, uh, venture capital invest in a lot of different things to have a portfolio. I think the true downside for an entrepreneur of throwing themselves too quickly and raising capital on something is that they spend a lot of time building a business that basically the world doesn't want. And I think the real currency that we have as an entrepreneur is really our time. And, and there's, if you raise capital, it's very difficult for you to sit down and basically uh, accept when, you, when customers don't want your product and then return some of the capital and stuff from scratch. And so most people, they basically keep kind of on this track that's going nowhere. Uh, thirdly, I would say uh, find a set of on uh, the investors that you really like and that really buys into the core mission of your business and craft a really good narrative around that. Like venture and especially seed uh, venture, um, it's all about investing in you and the prospects of the problems that you're trying to solve. And so if you can craft a narrative of where that's going, then um, I find that to be much easier. Storytelling is a big part of it, isn't it? I think so. I think that when we do the when we do new startups, we we're basically laying out what could be the most kind of positive version of the future. Like a lot of the time, we're going into spaces where if it made a lot of sense, then a lot of people have done it already. And so we're a little bit contrarian. We're a little bit kind of just seeing something there that a lot of people don't see at that time. And you have to have good storytelling, not just to get investment, but you have to hire talent people who are probably leaving well-paying jobs. You have to convince yourself that not too stupid. You have to um, convince your uh, partners and your peer group that this is smart. You have to be able to explain a compelling narrative to um, PR and things like that. And so if you don't have like a very good way of articulating your your vision, I think that makes it very difficult to get off the ground. You know, there's a lot to be said for mental strength. Do you have any tips of how you handle stress? <laughs> and how to, you know, I work out, that's my thing. So I hit the gym if I'm stressed out. I think we all have kind of our ways of dealing when the demons comes out, right? Uh, mm -hmm. um, and it's, I think part of the job of an entrepreneur is to take on that emotional responsibility for a lot of other people. Your VC don't necessarily want to know all the issues you're facing. You have to convince new staff, you have to convince your, your partner or yourself. And so there's definitely like a lot of, not necessarily just stress as in there's a lot of things to do, but also just there's an emotional anxiety that a lot of people expect you to take on your shoulders. And I think there's a lot of life hacks out there on how to make that better. I think going to the gym makes a lot of sense. I walk to work many, many days because that's my little kind of free time. I start to kind of dig into mindfulness and so on and so on into apps just to get a little bit more kind of headspace. And so um, I think there is a not necessarily like one thing you do. I think you find like a lot of different kind of small tricks that basically make you not go crazy. Mm -hmm. There's a funny story uh, to, to make your point. I, I heard one day that Richard Branson would ask, what is, if you had one advice to an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. what would you do? And he says, go to the gym. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there's definitely kind of, I definitely subscribe to kind of the mind and body kind of thesis that you need to make sure that you don't eat too many bad things and you don't kind of let your your fitness just go because of you're so busy but you try to create a balance um, because it's such a long game and the reality is statistically you're probably going to fail and so you might as well have a good time while you're doing it it's so true human serves it's amazing
But back to BarkBox, because I love BarkBox, it's such a great idea, and um, I really admire the smooth social strategy across all social networks that you do, um, because it's a really big company, it's got a really big voice. What's your advice for building an influencer community and running campaigns across all social networks? We have a little bit of a easier time, I think, than most other people, because we are in a space that naturally emotionally connect with people and so I sometimes feel that we get a lot of credit and definitely take it but we also have like a you know like a subject matter that lends itself very well to having very large Instagram and Facebook and, and email lists um, and so um, I'm not sure that all the way all the things that we've done is something that you can just replicate into other things um, I'll definitely say that you should get started uh, before you think. Uh, these things take a long time to develop. It's very difficult in the early days to really spot the ROI on on content marketing and, and, so, and social campaigns and so you kind of need to have that in your in your core DNA of your organization pretty early for you to start to see um, the impact on it. Um, we were lucky enough that we we hired an incredible storyteller Stacy, that was kind of one of our very early hires, and she really made it a voice, uh, gave it a voice on its own. I think what I might have done, which other founders could do, is to give her or give yourself the permission to have a point of view and not kind of become boring. You know, when we started to put dogs humping stuff on Wednesday because it was hump day, um, a lot of people kind of went like, hey, what are you doing? And this might alienate people. And I think we're definitely always of the mindset that we'd rather piss a few people off than being irrelevant. And so really take, you know, taking a, not a point of view, but just make sure that you express your personality. Um, and and you, you see it as a way to engage with your customer and not as a way of just kind of shouting at them. Um, and so uh, we've always been... I feel, feel pretty good of uh, being humble to the audience we serve and listen to them and then um, trying to do our best to entertain them and, and really share their excitement about their dogs. I love dogs. <laughs> I just, I, that's all I have to say. So, I just, it's just so, such a great brand. So do I. I uh, my life doesn't like have time for a dog right now, but in two years I'm getting a dog. And you can foster uh, I know, I'm all over the place, I'm never home. That's true. I'm never home, so I need something where I can just like, where an animal can travel with me, mm -hmm. because it's, LA is very LA, LA is very dog friendly. Yeah. Every agency in LA has a dog. Really? Like, you go everywhere and there are just dogs everywhere. There's basic dogs everywhere in general. Like, a lot of people don't realize how big an industry it is. There's you know, roughly 70 million dogs in the US, and so you're looking at 35% of households, 40% of households that have a dog. And so what's ironic, I think, about it is that it's been an industry that's been so large and it's really changed over the last few years where people consider their dogs more part of the family than necessarily pets. But there hasn't been a lot of development on the product side. And so what we're hoping to do with BarkBox and the products we make and, and sell through the product shop is to really create a new way for people to have an exciting time with their dog. So BarkBox has a vision of becoming Disney for dogs. What does that look like to Bark & Co? Can we expect a theme park? <laughs> I'd love to do a theme park uh, for dogs. Uh, I'd love to do more things that allow you to spend more quality time with your dog. So I think what's unique about Bark is that we, we don't see ourselves as a company that do one thing we see us as a company that solve one problem, and that is how do you make dogs and their people happier? And how do you make sure that they have more quality time that they can spend together? Because we love dogs and dogs like to hang with us. Um, and so um, what I think is unique about our approach is that instead of saying, well, we just do treats or we just do toys, we also are creating events and services and content and all these different things that really, I think, amplify our business. Um, and so, Yes, we would. I think there is room for a, a, a Disney World for dogs. Uh, I think that I am crazy enough to would love to go something to something like that, because the reality is that mo most of the time in in the U.S. you can kind of hang out in in your sofa or you can go for a walk in the in the park, 
but they aren't that many things you can do together with your dog. And so what we learned is that every time we create an experience where you and your dog can have a great time together, people seem to really be excited about it. That's really hard when you have to go on a vacation and you can't take your dog. It's heartbreaking. Exactly. Like my co-founder, Matt, always talks about dog jet, which is because he has a, he has a great Dane, so it, do, it doesn't really fit underneath the, the seat in front of him. Um, and so a lot of us feel a little bit scared about putting our dogs down in the cargo bay. And so if we can become much better of helping both evangelize and maybe even create services that will allow you to bring your dog on your next weekend trip, we would love to do that. I heard that Mariah Carey has a private chauffeur for her dog. I think that makes sense. And she just chauffeurs the dog from like coast to coast, like wherever the dog goes, the chauffeur just drives it, which is brilliant. I think it's brilliant. Like I, I, I would love to bring my dogs on more of my, my trips and you know, she's a, she's a kind of a, a lab uh, chow golden mix um, and so she's sort of a little bit of a, she's a big dog and so I just can't bring her when I travel anywhere so it's uh, I think that's an issue. So back to balancing work and uh, family life I think a lot of women get asked the question of how do you balance work and family and few people ask men that mm -hmm. so how do you balance work and family and life and everything else? I have a three-year-old son and so I definitely uh, am cognitive about wanting to be a dad that's there. Um, and I think, as with many things, you obviously have to make it a priority. Um, I'm not sure that I always subscribe to kind of like the Catholic approach of like, if you beat yourself to death for making your startup, then it will be successful. I think you need to have a light step when you walk into work every day. And you need to make sure you take your, your weekends and you need to make sure that you give yourself headspace to really solve some of the problems. And if you're just sitting over your computer, I don't think you can do that. And so I think it's good for business to be a, uh, have a good work-life uh, balance. I think for me, I'm very fortunate that my wife is uh, very similar to me in that she's very ambitious with her own kind of line of work. Um, but we really see it as kind of like a team. So. Um, She's done this incredible thing where she was had an incredible career in the movie industry doing visual effects, and then uh, when we had our son, she changed she changed her career completely. So she's now uh, studying uh, biology and chemistry, uh, and wanted to go into ironic love genetics. Um, <laughs> and, and so I think what one of the ways we get that to work is that we just have an incredible partnership at home uh, where we can help each other. So. If she goes to exams, I can kind of step out a little bit, and when I have very stressful times at work, she'll, she'll step up on it. Um, and then I think it's just something you have to do. There, as a founder, you never run out of things to do in the day. And so um, what I tend to do is to, in the morning, I have my kind of to-do system, and I put things that I have to put on that. Uh, I have to get done that day. And then I kind of feel a sense of gratification when I've completed that to-do list. So I don't end up kind of just get overwhelmed with all these things I have to do because I, in the morning when I'm a little bit clear, I can say, well, these are the things that I should achieve today. And if I achieve them, I, I've had a good day. Um, and so <clears throat> I think besides making a priority and, and besides uh, making sure that you, you are in a good partnership, um, I think it's just uh, about trying to make that balance. Those are my issues, you know, so I'm not sure that I have a very good question. But... No, I think it's great. I think in the end, you just need a good co-founder. It's like a, yeah. it's like a startup. You yeah. just need... I'd say that's another thing, right? You know, Matt, Matt and Kali at Bob Rocks, um, I would never have been able to do that by myself, partly because that they have so many skills that I do, don't have, but also just because of being able to share the workload. And so, um, you know, I'd rather, I think whatever I do, I will always have a co-founder now because I think doing it by yourself is just too difficult. It is. All right. So I have two more questions. Actually, three. They're really quick. Um, so startups focus on solving problems for the upper classes usually. In the future, how will tech innovate life for middle and lower classes now that smartphones make tech accessible to the most rural parts of the world? Like I was just backpacking through Vietnam and uh, Cambodia last year. Everybody had a smartphone, and it was just like even in India, you're just everywhere. So, what kind of products do you think we can develop? This is a really yeah. 
I think you're right that there's definitely companies that started out by going for a more affluent kind of audience. But if you take companies like Uber, I think they've shown a way where they can have like an exclusive product to start with, was kind of with Uber Black Cars, and then they can really use that to create a product that is for everyone. And they seem to be excited about this idea of even taking over public transport in many, many places. And so um, what I hope is that it's less about building products for rich people and it's more about using technology to give people who don't have as many means access to some of the, the services that, that more wealthy people had before. I think you're totally right that there will be some very big businesses being built to service um, kind of new areas like the emerging markets or even non-emerging markets but like huge kind of territories like India and obviously China and uh, South America and stuff like that. So um, technology has definitely been democratized on the supply side, on the demand side. Everybody has a smartphone um, and I think you increasingly are seeing startups that are kind of trying to jump into that space and creating products that is about scale. A few ones that spring to mind is kind of Boxed, uh, which is the mobile app, which is a little bit like Costco.com. Uh, uh, there's Holler out of, I think, LA, which is basically a dollar, kind of dollar products, one dollar products. And so you, I think you see more and more of these things kind of coming in now, and, and I think there'll be a lot of opportunity in that space. So I know you talk about um, AI from time to time, and I was thinking about how developing empathy in artificial intelligence is a challenge. And I wonder if there's a way we can help actual people in real life develop empathy first, because I think empathy lacks all over the world. So if we can figure out how to teach empathy to people, and then maybe take that knowledge and that format and start transferring it to AI, we might have a breakthrough. What are your thoughts on empathy and AI? I think you're right. You know, I've been pretty vocal about that. I think that a lot of the kind of bots right now um, are very utilitarian and they don't give people the experience that they, that they, need, they expect or they deserve. At Bach, we have something we call the happy team, which is our customer service team. It's more than that. They do everything from retention to selling to um, answering people on social and stuff like that. And so we've really managed to create, I think, a top-notch team uh, in Columbus, Ohio, that I think maybe because the Midwestern kind of like understands empathy very intuitively and has kind of made that a core of their DNA. What I think we hopefully are showing now is that having empathy and and celebrating that could also be good business. It's a little bit of like companies that do for profit for good. That if you have a, you take a component, then you can show that it doesn't have to be two opposite sides, end of the scales, where you either need to have empathy or you need to have profits, but you can have both. And so that's definitely something that we're passionate about pushing out. Like being a company where our brands, uh, our brand, and our brands in, in general are, um, brands that people have an emotional relationship to because they have a true relationship with us. Not because that we make cool TV ads or not because that we <clears throat> have a cheaper product, but because that we are somebody that they emotionally connect with. And that requires then a high sense of empathy. And so that's something that we're pushing, uh, pushing a lot. And so giving the permission, showing that it can be profitable. Um, and then I think as we become better and better understanding what it is that we're doing, you can start to have technology help you free up resources to allow you to do more empathy. So we would probably use bots for things like change my password or where's my bot box, which where you don't really need like to have a conversation about. And, and we hope that that will free up um, people's time in the happy team to having get excited about that your dog chewed something or, or that whatever, whatever it is that you're excited about your dog. That's great. So my last question is, What's your dream as an adult? Hmm. My dream as an adult. I think when when we talk about dreams and New Year's resolutions, because it was kind of just out of January, I looked a lot of kind of happiness research, and it looks like your happiness level is pretty constant. So no matter if you win in lotto, win the lotto, or you have an accident, you tend up kind of hitting the same happiness level about a year after those events. And so it made me think a little bit about 
kind of microdosing for happiness. You know, instead of thinking about these big events, selling companies or uh, fundraising or whatever it could be that most people kind of often identify as kind of their dream or that, uh, I think about what are things that I'm already doing, what are bright spots that will make me just a little bit happier and how could I do more of that. So um, going to the gym or uh, having a great time with my family or walking to work. So what I try to do now is, and I think what my dream is, is to be a holistic, successful person, not just with my businesses, but as a father and as a, as a husband and as a friend and as a, somebody who gives back to society. And so my dream is less kind of like big things and it's more a collection of micro doses of happiness. I think we remember the microdoses of happiness at the end of everything <laughs> more. Yeah, you know, we, we even, I was listening to a podcast, one of Tim Ferriss' podcasts the other day, and he has like a trick where you basically go through his calendar for the year and he basically writes things that made him happy and things that he thought was a waste of time. And then he started to try to see patterns around that. And so being a little bit thoughtful about these small bright spots is where I think we can easier achieve more happiness rather than chasing these kind of big fluffy events which at the end of the day often when you reach them doesn't really change your happiness level very much. I started looking at happiness last year too because it got to the point where we were just working a lot and I was just not happy and I was doing my startup and just like everything and I was like I knew something had to change but then I realized happiness is self-generated so you can self-generate it whenever you want to and it takes meditation mm. and you can just sit down take a few seconds and just like reprogram your brain yeah i think you can fake you can you fake, can it, fake it you make it right I mean, I, yeah I, you know and i think there's research around that but if you force yourself to smile it's going to release these hormones in your body yeah. that will make you happy and so i definitely and i think now when our companies are becoming bigger in size I think it's your responsibility to throw out that good energy. And so sometimes if I had like a little bit of a shitty day and I'm about to enter work, you know, I kind of kind of just man myself together and say, hey, you know, there's going to be a lot of people affected if I come in and look like I'm doom and gloom. And then I kind of take on the happy face and obviously that energy gets pushed back at you. And so therefore you very often become kind of in a good mood uh, after a little bit. It's true. Well, Henrik, I want to let you get back to <laughs> spreading the happy at Bark Box <laughs> and pre-hype. And thank you so much for sitting down. And I really appreciate it. And I think you rock. Thank so, you. so thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for tuning into the show. I hope you enjoyed it. Please share on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Dream Nation Love. It's not Dream Nation Podcast. It's Dream Nation Love because I think my single mission in life is to teach people how to love a little bit more. And together we can save the world. So it's Dream Nation Love, share it with your friends, have a great day, and go out and make the world a better place.